Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and we're continuing our series in this chapter. Uh, Many people have said that this is the greatest chapter in the greatest letter in the greatest book ever written. So we're seeing that this chapter, Romans 8, brings together gospel doctrine and life in the Spirit. So it holds together truth to believe and life in the Holy Spirit to experience. So each week we're seeing how what we believe shapes how we live, and this chapter is showing us that real Christianity is a fully integrated reality, meaning it, it is not just for intellectual types or for those who like experience or for those who love practical living. Real Christianity integrates the mind, the affections, our emotions, our will, our behaviors, and it touches every moment of life. There's no ultimate sacred secular divide. There's not to be a fundamental difference in our minds and hearts and lives between what we do on Sunday morning and what we do on Wednesday evening. And so this morning, we're looking at uh, several verses that bring together Uh, This reality, this fully integrated reality of real Christianity, um, by giving us and showing us our um, an identity shaping reality. So this is verses fourteen to seventeen, and in this text, we'll read it in a moment. This introduces us to what it means to be adopted into God's family. This shows the reality of adoption and its relevance for all of life. Now, one of the most important books, in my opinion, written in the last generation, mentioned it often, is Knowing God by J.I. Packer. And in my view, the best chapter in that book is called Sons of God, and it's on the doctrine and topic of adoption. And Packer begins that chapter by asking this question, what is a Christian? I wonder how you would answer that question. If someone asked you, what is a Christian? How do you answer that? Here's his answer. The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as Father. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he or she makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his Father father. The doctrine of adoption, the thought of the reality of becoming God's child is at the heart of real Christianity. This is also a doctrine that many of us may need more than we know. For many people, most of our deep issues in life are related to and rooted in a sense of alienation, a sense that we don't belong, a sense that we have been or will be rejected, a sense that we are an imposter, this imposter syndrome that is common in us that we have to somehow prove or fake our worth. We don't feel secure in a sense of being loved, and so we work for love. We work for the approval of people. We work for success. We labor to find belonging and peace. And so this is one reason why the reality of adoption is relevant. God has provided in Christ a root answer to so many of our deep struggles and challenges. He adopts us into His family and gives us security and love and belonging irrevocably and infinitely deeply. Spiritual adoption. It's a central theme in Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. The language of being sons and daughters of God saturates this paragraph. This text is here to show us that being adopted by God gives us confidence and hope in all of life. So let's read these verses together. Romans 8, beginning in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this reality of adoption through Christ. So we pray now that you would comfort and transform and challenge and encourage and convict and do all that you need to do in our minds and our hearts and our lives through the Holy Spirit. Help us understand the reality of what it means to be your adopted children. We pray for anyone who is not yet adopted into your family that that would happen this very morning through faith in your Son. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So adoption is perhaps the greatest benefit of the gospel, and it gives us a new confidence, can give us a new confidence in all of life. This text is here to help us understand and enjoy the reality of being adopted children of God. It answers three questions and gives four privileges. So here's what we'll do. We'll consider three questions about adoption, four privileges or benefits, and we'll consider five implications of this for our lives. So first, three questions about the doctrine of adoption here. First, what is adoption? What does it mean to be adopted into God's family? Look at the language used throughout this text. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Verse 15, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. And verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 17 also mentions being children of God. So adoption refers to God welcoming people into his family as loved and precious sons and daughters. The Roman Christians who first heard this would have understood this in part in light of their own cultural context. Adoption was common in Greek and especially Roman culture, and very often adult males were adopted into families, which is different than what's most common in our culture. Someone who had an estate or a heritage may not have had a son to pass it on to or children, and so he may adopt a servant of his or another young man into his family, and that man would become the legal and true son, legal and true family member, and legal and true heir with all the benefits and privileges of sonship in that culture. Paul's probably also drawing on the Old Testament background of this idea. Sonship is a central theme through the whole Bible. Adam was called a son of God, referring to his royal and kingly rule and role of ruling. Israel was called God's firstborn son, and he rescued them out of slavery. David was in a father-son relationship with God as the king, and Paul's now applying this language to all those who are united to Jesus through faith, to Christians. All who are in Christ are the true people of God, and they're adopted into God's family. They are the sons or children of God. So when we become united to Jesus through faith, that's what happens when someone becomes a Christian. You trust Jesus and you're united to Him. And you get all the benefits and blessings of salvation. And one of the greatest blessings is adoption. One of the blessings we first become aware of and that we end up talking a lot more about is justification. Justification, where our sins are forgiven and we're declared righteous in Christ. The ungodly can become righteous, declared righteous in Christ. And adoption is a higher blessing because justification is this legal and courtroom image, but adoption is a family and relational image. We are justified in order to be reconciled to God and brought into His fellowship. So, with justification, we're forgiven. With adoption, we become family. To be adopted is to have God as your father and Christ as your brother. Second question, who is adopted? Well, verse 14 describes us those who are, describes those who are adopted. It says, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So, it's those who are led by the Spirit of God who are sons of 
God. Now, this is a verse that's often taken out of context. So, some of you are joining me on Wednesday nights for a course on how to study the Bible, and this coming Wednesday we'll be considering context and looking at a number of texts that are taken out of context and therefore misunderstood. This verse is a common one that's taken out of context. Many Christians use this language of being led by the Spirit and draw attention to this very verse to refer to everyday guidance for even just amoral decisions in life. But this is not about guidance for ordinary decisions in life. This is about being directed by the Spirit to kill our sin and love our Savior. This verse, verse 14, is summarizing the previous verse that we saw last week if you were here. Look back back at verse 13 here. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So every true Christian will begin fighting sin and putting to death the deeds of the body on their way toward our eternal enjoyment of life. This has really been one of the central points Paul's making through the first 13 verses of chapter 8. Christians will begin fighting sin and living by the power of the Spirit to kill sin. It's what it means to be led by the Spirit here. It's being led by the Spirit to fight sin, to kill sin and love your Savior. Now, of course, that's going to influence all your decisions in everyday life. If you put sin to death and seek to love your Savior, a lot of decisions in life get pretty clear on what the best path is. But being led by the Spirit here is not about guidance on who to marry or what job to take. It's about being moved and motivated by the Holy Spirit to kill our sin. And Paul's point is this is what it means and looks like to be a real Christian. All true Christians are not only forgiven from sin's penalty, they are freed from its rule. And now Paul summarizes the point here, true Christians fight, and the way he puts it here in verse 14 is by saying, all who are led by the Spirit in this way, these are also sons of God. Now, to clarify this, he's not saying that our Spirit-led obedience earns our adoption. He's saying that our Spirit-led obedience proves that we are adopted already, because when you're adopted into God's family by grace, you live differently. So, to answer the question, who is adopted? It's those who trust in Jesus are adopted, and we're adopted from the very first moment we become a Christian. John put it this way at the beginning of the Gospel of John, to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it's those who receive Jesus, who believe in His name, who trust in Him. That's how we receive adoption. And then we live a different life, and it demonstrates that we are adopted. So this means it's not true to speak of all humanity as the children of God. Everyone has God as their creator but only those who come to Jesus and are united to Him through faith receive God as their Father. This leads to the third question, how are we adopted? And the answer is by grace. Remember how John put it, to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So everyone is born outside of God's family, But anyone can come to Jesus by the power of the Spirit to receive Him, to believe in His name, and those who do are adopted into God's family. So maybe you have been exploring Christianity for some time now. Maybe you've seen something different in a Christian friend of yours or family member, and you've been curious, who really is Jesus? What would it mean to follow Him? What would it mean for me to become a Christian? This is at the heart of it. It's to receive Jesus and to trust in Him, and then to be, through that, be adopted into God's very family, to become a child of God, forgiven of all your sin, and received into His welcome. So, those are the three questions. What is adoption? It's being welcomed into God's family. Who is adopted? Christians. And how are we adopted? It's by grace alone, through receiving Christ by faith. So now those three questions are important so that we can understand what Paul's mainly doing here in this text. He is mainly encouraging Christians with the privileges 
of being adopted into God's family. And we see four of them here. So let's look at each of them. First, a new confidence. Verse 15. You can read it again with me. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So this says that we had a spirit of slavery marked by fear, and that's gone, and we don't want to go back to that. That's a fear of judgment because of our sin. We haven't measured up because of our selfishness. We haven't measured up to God's standard of selfless love, and we know it. Our sin is in many ways self-addiction, and we keep doing the things we hate. A day of judgment's coming, and that day brings fear, and rightly so. But Jesus came to calm our fears, to free us from fear, to give us confidence. He came to die for our sins, to take our judgment, that the fear of judgment is gone, and we can now be welcomed into God's family. We now then have confidence before God, not because we're worthy, but because of God's mercy. So, we now have a new confidence. Being a child of God means you are out of the realm of condemnation for your sin, and you are into a new home, a secure place of belonging with God. You have a new confidence before Him that you carry with you into every moment, right up through the judgment. Second great privilege is a close relationship. To be adopted into God's family is to be welcomed and loved. It's to be wanted. It's to have a close and enduring connection with God. That's the second half of verse 15. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. It's an expression of incredible closeness. Abba is the Greek transliteration of an Aramaic word for father. It's the word that Jesus used to refer to God as father. We see him call God Father in Gethsemane under great distress. And it's not a formal word. It's, it's more like our English equivalent of dad than father. Some have said this means daddy, but I don't think that's quite right because it's not just language of a toddler or a young child to a dad. It's the language of any child of any age who has a close relationship with a father. And Paul's saying that we can now cry out, Abba, Dad, Father, we're invited into this kind of closeness with God, the kind of closeness that a loved and cared for and secure child has with a father. The doctrine of adoption means that God doesn't just bring us close, He wants us close. If you are in Christ, you are not only safe and secure, you are wanted. God wants you in His family. He chose you and He brought you near through Jesus. He doesn't just forgive you and then hope to forget about you. He loves you. The third privilege is assurance. To be a child of God means that we can be assured of our standing with Him. We can be assured of our salvation. This is verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So that's a sense of affirmation in your heart that you are God's child. It means that it's not just our own claim to be God's child, but that the Spirit Himself is also testifying and bearing witness that this is reality for us. Now, it's hard to know exactly how we can sense this personally. It's not that the Spirit whispers to us or talks to us verbally and says, you are God's child. It's probably more that the Spirit Himself is the one who leads us to call out Abba, Father. And so we have this deep sense that God is our Father, and we get that deep sense and confidence from the, very, the Holy Spirit. And this picture of the Spirit bearing witness, it's, it's almost like we're in a courtroom and we're bearing witness that we're children of God, and the Spirit's bearing witness with our Spirit together, confirming this reality. And so we can have this assurance that we are adopted. Now, the assurance of salvation is a tricky topic for Christians. Some people have an assurance that they are saved, but they shouldn't because they're not. And they need to be awakened to that, that they might seek true salvation in Jesus. Other people are truly saved, and 
they should have assurance of their salvation, but they always struggle with doubt and uncertainty. So some people need to lose their assurance. Some people need to gain their assurance. So how do we know which we are? Well, the New Testament gives three ways that Christians gain assurance of salvation, and they work together like three strands of a cord. If you only have one of these strands, it's not going to always hold the weight that it needs to hold. It'll hold you for a bit, but it may eventually be too weak for you. So here are the three. Sheer faith, self-examination, and the Spirit's witness. So sheer faith, that's looking away from yourself and looking to Christ alone. You simply trust Him. You look to Him. You see Him as your Savior. You hold to Him. You receive Him with empty hands of faith. You trust His promise to rescue you, and you have, through that sight of faith, an assurance that He is yours and you are His. Self-examination is now looking to yourself to see if there is evidence that you have true faith. The book of 1 John says we look to three realities in ourselves to, to confirm this. Do we believe in the real Jesus? Do we love God and others? Not perfectly, but truly. Has the Spirit actually given us a new heart or not? And are we obeying God? Again, not perfectly, but truly. So, true belief, love for God and, and His people, and obedience. Those are the three marks of a real Christian in the book of 1 John to confirm our confidence and assurance. The third strand, so sheer faith and self-examination, the third strand is the Spirit's witness, and that's what Paul is talking about here in verse 16. It's a privilege of adoption. We have our own spirit that trusts Jesus and believes we're His children. We're looking to Him, and we trust Him for salvation. We may have that sheer faith. We may have self-examination, so we see according to verse 13, we're putting to death the deeds of the body. We're killing sin by the Spirit, because the Spirit's within us, and that confirms that we're His children. But we often need a third assurance, the assurance that the Spirit alone can give us. Now, why would God give us assurance? Why does this matter? Well, He wants us to be assured that we're His children. He wants us to be assured of our salvation. He wants us to know that He really is our Father, and we are really secure in His love. He doesn't want us to wonder about it. He doesn't want us to kind of sheepishly set a tent up in His backyard hoping He doesn't kick us out, right? He says, the doors are open. Come in. I have a room for you. You are my daughter. You are my son. The issue of assurance has been controversial in various sections of history. It was one of the key issues in the Protestant Reformation. One of the Roman Catholic objections to Luther and Calvin and other Protestants was this very issue. One of the theological advisors to the Pope had said, the greatest of all Protestant heresies is assurance. The Council of Trent says that no one can know for sure if they have obtained the grace of God. This is a crucial point of difference between the official Catholic teaching and Protestant teaching. I would say between the official Catholic teaching and Romans 8, God's very word. You can tell a lot about someone's grasp of the gospel by asking this question, do you think you can know that you're saved? Do you think that you can have assurance before God that He is your God and you're His child? The answer in Romans 8 is yes, and it's because of the nature of the gospel that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and you can be sure. And the Holy Spirit Himself wants you to know. If you are adopted in Christ as God's child, He wants you to know it. It matters to Him. And it matters, it should matter to us too, because there is a world of difference psychologically between wondering if God actually loves you and you're His and knowing that He loves you and you're His and you're secure in His love. It changes why you do what you do. The Puritan Walter Marshall said, 
you simply cannot love and obey God in the way that he's calling us to unless you know that he loves you. Fourth benefit, a bright future. In the Roman society, Paul's writing within here, sons were set to inherit their father's estate. The future of that son was determined by the wealth of that father. What then do the children of God have in store for them? Well, Paul says that if we are children, then we are heirs. All that he has becomes ours. This is verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So if we're children, then we are heirs of God. Now that could refer to, it certainly does include all of God's promises. We are heirs of everything God promises us. And what is that? Well, it's, this is where the doctrine of the resurrection, the new creation shine. Because history is headed toward the renewal of all things. The whole world will be remade and made new. And God is saying, it is your inheritance. All that's mine is yours. So our future is not going to heaven eternally to float on clouds with robes and harps, but to live in a new creation with the Lord Jesus, with our triune God and his people forever. And he's going to give it to us. And all of this is our inheritance. Listen to the end of 1 Corinthians 3. It's one of those most amazing verses, or a couple verses in, I think, the whole Bible. All things are yours. So speaking to Christians, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God, God's. So he's saying that if you are united to Jesus, Everything is yours because you are his and all that he has is yours. And this could mean being heirs of God is referring to God as our inheritance, which is the greatest gift. God himself is our inheritance. Paul also says we're co-heirs with Christ. Christ is the ruler of the world. He will reign over all things forever and we will share in his rulership. Really, the fulfillment of what we were made to do from the beginning in Eden having dominion over all things, to rule and reign as stewards of God's creation, reflecting His character. Jesus is the only one doing that perfectly now, but we're united to Him, and we're seated and enthroned with Him right now to reign with Him forever and be heirs with Him of glory. Think of the difference adoption means for us. Think of where we came from and where we're heading. We were spiritually poor, enslaved to sin, headed toward eternal death and judgment, And now we're made alive, set free, adopted into God's family, and set to inherit the world. This bright future is not yet a full reality. The pathway toward that future is marked by suffering. You probably saw that at the end of verse 17. We are co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. So Paul's saying that our path toward glory is the same as Jesus's. Suffering then glory. Isn't that, wasn't that Jesus's pattern? The Christian life is following Jesus in Jesus's own pattern. Suffering and then glory. Self-denial and then reigning. And when we become Christians, we follow that same path of suffering and then glory. The health and wealth and prosperity gospel gets it half right They say that because we're God's children, we're king's kids, that we have access and we're the access to and we're the owners of everything. We can be blessed with health and glory. And they get that half right because health and glory are coming because we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. But they get the timing wrong because we don't get all of that stuff in its full experience yet. God promises suffering now and glory later, which is why we live with this frustration and longing as Christians, because we know who God is. We know His kind heart. We know that He's set to bless us with all things, and yet life is so hard. Some of you are having a terrible time in life right now. It is really hard and painful and sad, but that doesn't mean that God is not for you 
And it doesn't mean glory's not coming. It means the path is suffering and then glory. Glory. You have him as your father. He won't bring anything into your life without his fatherly approval, even if it's hard. But it's for your good, and it's temporary, and it's leading to glory. So your life may be hard now, but your future is incredibly bright. So let's just consider several implications now. Here's five radical implications. First, if you've not already, come home to God. Do you feel alienated from your Creator, separated from Him? Have you seen people who actually know God and you wonder what that must be like? God is a Father and He stands ready to welcome all who come to Him through Jesus. Jesus once told the story that we refer to as the prodigal son now, of this son who left his father, wanted the inheritance early, went and wasted it, squandered it, didn't live according to the standards of the father, really an insult and a shame to the whole family. And then he goes on his own, and he ends up with empty pockets and an empty heart, And he knows that he would be better going back home, even if he was just a servant at his father's property. And so he goes back, but he's fearful. He doesn't know how his father's going to react. And that father sees him coming and runs and embraces him and throws a party for him because he is his son. And that father wants him. So if you have been squandering all God's goodness to you and you have been far from home, turn to Jesus, repent of your sins, and come to the Father, and He will warmly, gladly welcome you home forever. Second, Christian, let this function as your identity. Our identity is our self-understanding. It's who we know ourselves to be, who we think ourselves to be, and it has a profound impact on how we feel at any given moment, at any given day, and what we live, and what kind of ambitions we have. Many Christians have come home to God, they've received this identity as a son or daughter, but they still feel alienated from God, often. They still feel like they don't belong anywhere. We feel out of place. Maybe you feel out of place wherever you are. And this leads to all sorts of insecurities and unhealthy coping behaviors. And our culture is telling us all the time, we need to find our identity. It's really important. And how you find it is by looking inside at your feelings, especially right now, find your sense of gender and sexuality, or find your identity from what other people think of you. But God gives us a better self-understanding. He says, you can know that you are my son. You are my daughter. And I am your father. And I'll care for you. And you're an heir of all creation. So enjoy this. Remind yourself of this identity every day. You have a home. You do belong. Third, let the doctrine of adoption heal you. Here's what I mean. So many of our issues in life are partly a result of the way our parents treated us or mistreated us. Many of you have felt abandoned in your childhood, and this sense of abandonment is carried with you through your whole life, or you've been neglected, or you don't have the security and assurance and unwavering love that you needed, and you still feel like this is a massive gap in your own heart. And this has had a profound effect on your life. Many studies show that men and women who have a supportive mother and father navigate life better. They take less risky, they they do less risky behaviors. Therapists, one therapist said that 70% of his clients have strong stories of parental neglect, especially emotionally. They try to make it through adulthood for a while, but then they eventually come to him. 
So many men are seeking success mainly to settle this sense in their heart that their dad doesn't approve them. But what if we let it seep into our soul that we have a father and he's for us and he loves us. He's not just a distant God out there. He's a father, our father, and he loves you and he wants you and he accepts you and you are secure in that and it's irrevocable. He promises to give you the inheritance of the world and he's happy to do it. You don't have to live for approval anymore. You can live from a deep sense of approval. And children or young men and women here, your parents will fail you. God has not given anyone perfect parents, but you can know even now the truest father. And and you can know him as your father. And then whatever good you see in your parents, in your father or your mother, is a reflection of his goodness and a gift from him to you. And whatever you see of failure in your father or your mother, and there's plenty, you can know that that's the opposite of how your father is toward you. Fourth, let's reflect this adopting love of God. Parents, as you enjoy the adoption of God moment by moment, reflect it to your kids, no matter what age they are. Reflect His warm love and care to your younger kids or your older adult children. Don't just support them physically and financially in those early years. Support them emotionally. The Wall Street Journal just had an article, I think last week or the week before, showing that strong emotional support is connected to children learning to manage their own emotions and deal with mental health issues. So when you fail, apologize and point them to the father who never fails. And consider adopting or supporting adoption. Christians have always been people who adopt. And it's because adoption is what people do when they're adopted by God. Adoption is something Christians do because Christians are adopted. That's how this works. In the early centuries, Christians were the ones who adopted children rather than letting them be left to die. Abortion wasn't prominent then. Instead, people exposed their children, exposed them to the elements, either hoping that someone would pick them up and take care of them or just wait for them to die through this exposure. And Christians would find them and receive them and adopt them and raise them and love them because that's what God has done for them. And that's what God's done for us. So as long as children need a home, and many do, then Christians should gladly welcome them in. Now, of course, not everyone can raise a child, so maybe your role is to come alongside a couple who's adopting and financially support them or offer help in some other way. And maybe it's to pursue foster care, and safe families is an option as well, and many of you do this already. And when you adopt, you have an opportunity to demonstrate the gospel to the world around you and within your own home, to honor this child as the Lord has honored you, to provide security and support, not just financially, but emotionally and physically and spiritually, just as God cares for us, and to give the inheritance freely, just as God gives you a great inheritance. Finally, let this set the tone of your life. Christians should have an underlying and overarching tone of security and joy. We're the adopted children of God. He welcomed us into His family. Our future is bright. We are loved. So much of what's wrong in our lives and in our culture is from people trying to find what we already have in Christ. And so let's enjoy this. Let's enjoy being family together with other brothers and sisters in this church and other churches, all who are united to Jesus. And let's just live with this great confidence before God. And in great distress and in the suffering that's on the way to glory, cry out, Abba, Father, because He's near. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You so much for this reality. 
We thank you that the more we learn of who you are and what you've done for us in Jesus, the more wonderful it is to us. We thank you that there are immeasurable riches, treasures in what it means to be saved. And we thank you especially this morning for adopting us in Christ and for being our Father and for caring us for us even when we don't care for you. And so we thank you for the Spirit's presence to bear witness with our spirit that we're your children. And we pray that you would give us a great sense of security in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this last song comes.